My name is Dr. Derek Doris. I am a head of Department of Psychology here in PCI College. I'm also the head of academia, so a kind of a dual role. I'm in charge of academic standards, which cover the counseling and psychotherapy courses, as well as my own courses within the uh, psychological department. Um, my background is um, a little bit diverse. I began in UCD, I did my degree, my master's, my PhD, and two postdoctoral research projects in UCD. I then went uh, and studied, uh, lectured, I was a college lecturer in UCC in the Department of Psychology down there for five years before I came back up to Dublin and took on this role in PCI College. What particularly impressed me and really uh, encouraged me about coming to PCI College was the particular remit that I was being handed. I was being asked to create a psychology department from scratch. And very rarely do you get a chance to do that in this particular country. You always come in. I lectured in UCD psychology, and I had no real choice as, what to, as to what was on the actual curriculum. I could change my module. That was about it. Um, and when you're lecturing in a subject for about 10 years, 12 years, like I think it is now, that I'm lecturing in psychology in, you develop a very strong belief that psychology should be changed or the, the teaching of psychology should be changed in different particular ways. And that was a, that's what I was given a chance and opportunity to do. Um, what we decided to do straight away, instead of running straight into a degree, which is where we will end up hopefully next year uh, providing a, an actual degree in psychology, we decided to actually uh, just build a couple of modules around the core areas in psychology, the core subjects. Um, the core subjects to any psychological degree, to any understanding of psychology, are biology, biological psychology, cognition or cognitive psychology, and social psychology. They are the three core subjects. You have developmental psychology and personality psychology, which are also essential subjects, but they're not as core as um, cognitive psychology, biological psychology, and social psychology. So what we have here um, is a, a taste from the biological psychology module. Now, I haven't actually just taken out a section of lecture slides from a, a given lecture within that particular module. I've just framed these uh, slides around a particular uh, talking point that tends to occur within biological psychology a lot. And it's also a talking point that you might have found yourselves, if you're any way interested in psychology, which I assume you are, you might have found yourself uh, considering a number of times in your life beforehand. It's also a question you tend to ask yourself whether you don't have an, whether you have an interest in psychology or not. It's the type of thing that uh, all human beings are profoundly interested in because our thoughts, our personal thoughts, that the, those things we hear inside our head when we talk to ourselves, or those emotions we feel, or those behaviours which we uh, um, uh, enact, are with us all the time. They're the one thing that is with us all the time. They're the one thing that we always have access to that nobody else has access to. Okay, maybe our overt physical behaviours in the world, other people can see them, but only we know really why we engage in them. And even sometimes we actually don't. But our familiarity with our own brains and with our own minds has given us a real strong, understand, a real strong interest in uh, what makes that brain tick. It also has, believe it or not, actually given us a half-decent understanding of the brain. Most of us, if we were really pushed to it, would probably come up with a decent explanation of what makes the brain tick. Um, at the same time, the other half of our understanding would most likely be very flawed. So, for example, we could talk about um, what it is that made me uh, you know, uh, lash out at a person who, was, who I was angry with, but we wouldn't really be able to talk about necessarily why the things that he, were say he or she was saying make me angry in general. Those things might be a little bit hidden. Those things might be so long ago, might have occurred so long ago that they're very difficult to dissect and identify at this particular time. So we do have a decent amount of access to our own mental faculties, but not a full level of access. And where psychology steps in is to try and fill in that, the, the remaining 50%, to try and take what you already know and intuitively believe about the brain and try and refine that in terms of what we understand from scientific analysis and scientific experimentation into psychology. Before I start, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Okay, right, the title of this particular talk is How Can three, uh, three Pounds of Brain Matter Produce Thought, Emotion, Memory and Consciousness? Now, I'm going to spend the first part of this particular lecture talking about thought, emotion and memory primarily. I'm not going to get bogged down in thoughts, emotions and memory. I'm only going to talk about them very generally. I'm going to be more interested in the actual neural architecture that underlies them because at the end of the day, we all know what thoughts are, we all know what emotions are, and we all know what memories are. But what we don't know is what's actually sitting underneath them. What is it that allows a particular thought to emerge within the brain? Um, the idea of thoughts and memories as separate entities are, is itself a controversial issue within psychology. Um, for example, a memory of, your, um, uh, of what you did last Christmas Day. You can activate that memory and you can think about it. 
it's a memory that you are thinking about. So it's both a memory and a thought. So the idea of memory being separate from thought is not something you need to get bogged down on. If you want to see memories as the same thing as thoughts, that's fine. At the same time, you might say to yourself, I think I want um, uh, you know, fish and chips for dinner today. That is kind of a thought. It's not necessarily a memory. You might be thinking back to the last time you had fish and chips, but it's more of a thought. So it is quite independent of memory in that respect. So thought can be the same as memory or a little bit more specific. It can be a general term or it can be a specific term. And memory is pretty much memory. We use memory uh, in a pretty consistent fashion. When we think about things that happen to us, we're thinking about our memories. If we're driving a car, we actually are relying on our memories for how to drive a car, but it's not exactly the same as thinking back to you know, what happened last Christmas Day. Um, so I suppose in that respect, memory can be differentiated a little bit as well. Consciousness, on the other hand, is a whole different ball of wax. We as psychologists still don't know what consciousness actually is. Consciousness is essentially, uh, if we were to forced to try and define it, our online experience of what we're experiencing or what we're seeing or hearing or feeling right now. So I am conscious of your faces in front of me. I am conscious that I am here to do a particular job. I am conscious that I'm talking to you about biological psychology. I'm not necessarily, as I'm, as I'm saying these things to you, I'm not necessarily conscious of who I am. I'm not conscious of my name because I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about what I have to do here in front of you guys. But now that I'm thinking about my name, I'm now conscious about my name. So conscious is kind of like a mental spotlight that shines around the different thoughts that we have in our head at one time or another. And whatever thought or action or emotion it lands on becomes part of our experience at that particular microsecond. The first thing we need to know about the human brain is it's pretty special as far as animal brains go. Um, it is proportionally the largest brain in the animal kingdom. So we have the blue whale swimming out there somewhere, which is the largest animal in the world. Um, and its brain is not proportionally as big as the human being's brain. Um, mountain lions are about the animal in the animal kingdom that are roughly about the closest to the human body in terms of body weight and size. So if you stood a mountain lion on top of its, on its hind legs, it would roughly average out as the same height as an average human being, and it would roughly be the same weight. Um, yet our brains are seven times larger than the brain of a mountain lion. So you can understand and appreciate how significantly uh, difference or differentiated the human brain is to other animal brains uh, just by comparing it to like uh, animals of a, of a similar weight or size. Um, of course you have to be careful, um, you know, mountain lions are not typically the, the animals we attribute most intelligence to in the animal kingdom. We're talking about primates, dolphins and whales when we talk about those animals, but our brains are significantly larger than theirs, proportionally speaking, also. Despite the size of the human brain, however, it still actually appears to psychologists to be rather rudimentary when you look at it for the first time. So if you take a brain in your hands from a cadaver and throw it on a table and look at it, like you have to do if you're a medical student or if you're a psychology student studying um, neuroanatomy, um, a brain looks rather meager, especially when you start seeing it sort of, you know, when we see lovely pictures of the brain, it's, it's nice and uh, firm, but actually a brain kind of just splitches out a little bit and it becomes very flat and it looks very insignificant altogether. And as a result, psychologists have long struggled with the idea that everything we're capable of doing mentally, all the thoughts we're capable of generating, all the ideas that we're capable of experiencing, and all the behaviours we're capable of enacting, they're all stored in this tiny amount of protoplasm. A, t a miserable three pounds of protoplasm as our, one of our most famous neurocognitive psychologists, Marilyn Donald, describes. So you've got three pounds of protoplasm, which is basically just flesh, the specific type of flesh that the brain is made of, and everything they were capable of doing, the Mozarts of this world and the things that they were capable of doing, the Einsteins, the things that they were capable of doing, um, the Lionel Messi's, the things that he was capable of doing, all of this is just stored within this flesh, this mass of flesh. Not only that, but all their lifetimes of memories and all their emotions and all their thoughts, the thoughts that we busy our lives with, they were crammed into that load of flesh as well. So psychologists were always a little bit dubious, especially in the early days of uh, anatomical research, as to how the brain could possibly um, satisfy and uh, facilitate all, these, all the, me the mental prowess of the human being. What happened eventually, though, is we started developing a lot more specific scanning technology. We developed PT scans, positron emission tomography, PET scans, you might have heard them being referred to as CAT scans, computer axial tomography, um, MRI scans, 
uh, or fMRI scans, which is frontal magnetic resonance imaging. So anyone who's ever been in a MRI tube to get their back looked at if they've injured their back, uh, we stick human beings in those tubes and we just look at their brain. And these scanning abilities have allowed us to appreciate the depth of miniaturization of the human brain that we were never able to previously appreciate. And what I mean by miniaturization is that if you look at the brain and just see it as a, as a load of flesh in your hand, it's going to look pretty meagre. But if you then look at it microscopically and electromicroscopically, and you start looking at what those little bits of flesh are comprised of, you're going to see these tiny, tiny little cells called, anyone know? Begins with N? Neurons. And those neurons are not only the building blocks of the human mind, um, but the links in between those neurons. And on average, every single neuron is linked to about 2,000, between 2,000 and 10,000 other neurons. Those links between neurons are what give rise to complex human thought. When neurons fire, and this is the thing about neural activity and neurons in general, what really makes them tick is basically a process called neural activation or, well, if we want to get really technical about it, we can call it activation potential um, or action potential. But basically what that means is that whenever you think about a certain thought, whenever you experience a certain thought or if you see a face of a friend that you recognize, certain neurons in the brain that are dedicated to processing that type of information fire. In other words, they kick into activation. They're always at a state of low level of activation. The brain is, if the brain is alive, there's always a low level of activation right throughout all the neuro neurons within the brain. But when, it, when a particular neuron comes in contact with a stimulus that is relevant to it, it kicks into proper activation. And that's what we believe is at the root of every thought that we experience. Now, it's crucial to point out that in the human brain, such as the connectivity and the overlap, that there is no such thing as experiencing a thought and having only one corresponding neuron firing. It doesn't happen. Every thought, no matter how simple it is, is the result of at least thousands and thousands of neurons firing. So there's always thousands of neurons firing regarding, uh, in relation to no matter what thought you're experiencing, to support whatever emotion you're feeling or whatever action you're carrying, carrying out. It's always thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of neurons involved. So I stress, the brain is built on an electrochemical architecture. That is, the neurons, when they fire, are firing into activation because of both electrical activity and chemical activity. I talked about it very briefly when we looked at the diagram of the neuron. A neuron receives information from one end, a signal, electrical signal, travels down the length of the neuron and releases a particular code into what we call the dendrites, the little arms of the, of the neuron. And that those dendrites then release what we call neurotransmitters, which are chemicals, into the synaptic cleft. And those neurotransmitters are what allow one neuron to talk to another neuron. They send specific messages saying, this guy is telling me there's a ball coming towards your face. Pass the information on so we can get to the neuron that controls, the, the group of neurons that controls you lifting your arm and catching the ball or not getting hit by the ball. Okay? So, Electrochemical activity is what is mostly important, and most important to bear in mind when we think about neural activity. Neurotransmitters allow one neuron to communicate with another neuron, and it's the chemical signals specifically which allow us to do that. What they do essentially is allow us to quickly react to everything that's going on around, around us. So if somebody shouts your name in a crowd, and you automatically orientate your head towards the direction of, from which the sound came, that is because there was, yes, chemical, uh, electrical activity within the brain, but also chemical activity within the brain. And at some point, a group of neurons came together and sent chemical message after chemical message after chemical message saying, somebody is calling something that sounds like your name. Yes, it's your name. Somebody is calling something that's your, uh, some, uh, saying something that's your name. Somebody is trying to get your attention. Somebody that sounds like your aunt is trying to get you attention. Yes, it's your aunt. Your aunt is trying to get you attention. Turn around and say hi to your aunt. So that kind of process occurs as neuron after neuron activates, each, activates one another in an electrochemical um, a process. So what I do want to talk to you about just right at the end of this now is just what we're offering here within PCI, okay? This is one module, one example of one module within psychology. It's the most difficult module by far. It's the biological psychology module. We then move on to the cognitive psychology module, which there will be a public lecture on next month. Uh, the social psychology module. And in the cognitive psychology module, we look at performance psychology. So um, performance, sports performance, musician performance, performing within a company. And we look basically at how cognitive mechanisms underlie those applied performances in the real world. What is it that allows us to behave in the real world like we do? What is it about the cognitive mechanisms that we rely on that allow a sports athlete to perform well in one match and poorly in another match? Or a business manager to lose control of one room and maintain control of another room? 
in the social psychology module, we, the, apply, the, uh, the applic application that we look at is clinical psychology. We look at basically, sorry, criminal psychology. How is it that the social structures that guide our behavior and rule our behavior, many of which we discuss, discussed in this lecture, how is it that they can shape and form a criminal? How can they produce a person who doesn't see any wrong in killing people? How can we, they can produce a person who doesn't see any wrong in pedophilia? How do we actually then a, approach the treatment of, in the, of those individuals? Which treatments are going to fail? Which treatments are going to work? How do we know they're going to work and how do we know they're going to fail? Personality psychology is the next module, and in that we look at clinical psychology. So we look at the development of personality research, what is personality, and then we look at personality disorders. What type of mood disorders exist? How are they tied back to the idea of personality? And then from there we move on to health psychology, which is the last module, which is a module that looks at how psychologists contribute to health initiatives within Ireland and within wider European affairs. And we pick real world examples of actual initiatives that are on the go, and we look at the role of psychologists within those initiatives. And we see how those psychologists are bringing what they learned in their core modules of cognitive psychology, biological psychology, and social psychology to these eclectic and interdisciplinary uh, meetings and approaches and uh, agendas. Um, all the modules are available to do on their own. If you want, you do, and you just want to do the biology module or the cognitive module, you can do the modules on their own. There is, if you want to do all the modules together, a postgraduate certificate which we offer, which is very intense because you're doing six very difficult uh, modules. Um, there, are eight hour, there are eight lectures long and three hours long for each lecture, so you're doing 24 hours of lectures <coughs> per module. And I don't hold back, I give you the full whack when it comes to understanding psychology. I give you the basis, but then I also give you the relevance of those bases to the real world. Um, so if you want to do all those modules together, the postgraduate certificate is available to you. You must, however, have already got a degree in a subject other than psychology if you want to do the postgraduate certificate. If you want to do the course but don't have a degree in a, in a different subject, then you're still entitled to do the individual modules on their own. And if you want, you can do all six individual modules on your own, but there won't be a postgraduate certificate at the end of it for you. You will be assessed at a postgraduate level. If you're doing the postgraduate certificate, you'll be assessed at a postgraduate level throughout, and you will be given exams at the end of the year. If you do the individual models, you will be assessed, but it'll be um, a less uh, difficult assessment and um, you will get a certificate at the end of each module itself.